Så att, eh, ja, eh, är vi redo? Okej, okay. välkomna till Konstantverkarna ikväll och vårt artist med Tobias Viljersson här. Och eh, Tobias är en av fyra smeder som ställer ut eh, i den här utställningen som vi har här som heter Uncommon Element. Och eh, de andra är Rebecca Frank från USA, eh, Sofie Hammagat från Frankrike och Schweiz och Nils Hint från Estland. Eh, men av förklarliga skäl så kan inte de vara med här. Men Rebecca Frank kommer att hålla en Zoom-föreläsning eh, på måndag. Så att ni kan titta på vårt Instagram för då lägger vi upp en länk till det. Men vi är jättetacksamma att Tobias är här och Tobias har verkligen haft ett stort stöd med den här utställningen eftersom vi trodde att de andra utställarna skulle vara med och bygga och sådär, men det landade på dina, dina och mina axlar. Jättetrevligt samarbete med dig och du har stor hjälp. Sen med oss ikväll så har vi också Tobias Alm som kommer att leda en liten frågestund efter Tobias föreläsning. Men jag lämnar över ordet till dig så får du ta vid här. Tack så mycket. Jag hoppas att det är okej okay för er som sitter i rummet att jag kommer att byta till engelska. Eftersom det är de flesta som är där inne på internet kommer att inte kunna prata svenska. Så, so, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm not great at speaking in public spheres like this, but I'll do my best. Um, I think this is one of the first times that I get to do the whole ego thing, just, just speaking about me, not trying to be an educator or addressing a topic. So, um, yeah, I need to tell you and you everything about, or something about my background. Um, I have 12 years of Steiner School, which is completely infused in craft, I would say. I've been an apprentice in Germany for a while as a blacksmith. And I have a couple of years in Sweden, working with forging at university level in Stenaby. I have the same education with precious metals. I have five years Konstfak and the list goes on. I mean, most of us that work with craft have these kind of backgrounds which most people that go to exhibitions don't realize that. And on, on top of that, it's also 20 years of experience. I've uh, founded Galerie Lund, Kungsholm. And yeah, and then I've been into, into teaching at university level and preparatory level for 13 years at two different universities. So extensive background. All of that doesn't matter at all as soon as you have an exhibition. <coughs> Then it's all about you, the material, and what you want to say with it. Um, Can you speak a bit higher? With sure, curiosity? I'll speak louder, no problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, this talk will be about um, the toolness of things, which is a part of, of my projects that I've been working with for a while, but it will also be it's the constructed. Here I need to add on that my background is my generation's background is all about aesthetical choices and the materiality. That was my background. Nowadays, it's a different discourse within the university level. And I would say the same goes for most uh, preparatory schools too. Can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, so again, the organic versus the constructed. Uh, the first man-made vessel. Materiality collaboration between me and other makers and what is an exhibition um, okay this is the first time I started I tried to find something that had the juxtaposition from the I don't, I've never found a better word for it than lavi aesthetics, in Swedish, that get out big aesthetic. <laughs> you know, you, you fix around with your engines and your things and then it's, it's kind of, 
it has definitely male connotations. And, and Excuse me, what, what, what did you call it in English? Laddie, yeah. Um Anyway, so um, I wanted to have something that, a polarity to that. I needed to find something that was organic in a way that, you know, basically, when I made these kind of constructions, they were dead and boring to me, so I needed something else to make it more interesting. It was that easy. And so I tried to do things out of metal this way, but I, have a very, I, have a t I had a tendency to make things way too anal, way too perfect. By doing that, I killed them. So um, I started working with, this is actually a calabas from Africa that I brought home as a 14-year-old from Tanzania. It was broken, I repaired it and put uh, gold leaf and lacquer and things like that on it. That was the beginning of this thinking. The picture is from a show that faculty, a team of faculty members and I did at uh, Consfac Erdelab. And this is uh, a huge long table. This is the subconscious of art education. So instead of using plinths, we basically took out everything we could find that we that weren't nailed down and built the plinth out of it. Um, yeah, so the organic, I believe, I am a hallware maker, right? I believe that the first vessel is probably this. Most of you will probably agree, right? This is scoop up water, we still use it if we're on a hike, right? Um, I think the second vessel must have been some kind of dried husk or a shell or something that we find that can contain liquid or small seeds or some kind of soup, moisture. And that's why I went back for this gourd. The gourd is still used as a vessel even though it's not, most of it has been exchanged for plastic nowadays, but still, it's the, I think it's the origins. Of course, I do not have proof for that because all of these things are gone, right? But at least I can track it back thousands of years, which is okay. Um, so I started working with these kind of uh, gourds and started repairing them. But instead of repairing them in a very practical way, I repaired them with precious metal. This is uh, silver instead of, you know, just pieces of plastic or leather or something like that. And um, that brings me into the materiality and how to look at the materiality. So I go back and forth from making and then assessing what I've made and trying to figure out if what I've done is good. And when I say good, it's not good for everyone, it's good for me. If it makes sense for me as a maker and an artist, then it's good, right? Somebody else might think that this is completely stupid and not important at all. Completely unimportant to me, right? It's only about how I assess things, right? Um, so, details have always been interesting to me and important. This is um, an answer. I've done these gourds for different projects, right? That's usually how I'm driven. I've been invited to do something for a specific thing. This was a collaboration uh, with a philosopher in um, Munich, Paravo Majumdar. I did a project with my uh, faculty friends at Konsfak back then, before we swapped jobs. But um, this is about decoration. How, how, much, how much can I overload an object? That's, so this is kind of my border. For somebody else, this is not overloaded at all, right? So it's all about your personal subjective decoration, right? And I do think that I create decorative art, definitely. Um, yeah, so here's a close-up of the same thing. The piece is called Maller, Gresan. Um, and you see here clearly the, uh, the super exact machine feel. And then this, I think this is so tasty. To me, it's still, I, I can't beat this organic fruit. I can't. So it's, yeah, everything I do is, doesn't come close. And then, 
about materiality. So <clears throat> I am a material geek. A lot of crafts people are, I would say. They go into details, they talk about what, why, how. Many art criti critics or people that come from different worlds, when I have this discussion with them, they're just, oh, Jesus, this is so boring. Why, why do you even care, right? So it's, it's all about what I'm interested in, right? So this is uh, a rock. It's called Zinnober. And it's, it has mercury in it. It's kind of closed in, so you don't die from it. But you, you grind this down to create the, uh, the color that is the base for the gold leaf, right? So, um, yeah, the gold for these pieces um, is actually from the same batch that is still on top of the city hall in uh, Stockholm, Stadshuset. So it's, the batch is made in 1962, which is, I think it's cool. A lot of people think it doesn't matter, right? So it's, yeah. Um, so basically, I've been working back and forth with these things. And sometimes I do the mass commission. Sometimes this is from a show last summer in uh, on Ireland, Vida Museum. Which year? Huh? Well, how old were you? Which year? For the Last summer. Last summer, this yeah. one? Yeah. Uh -huh. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, uh, my uh, partner in crime here, to be yes, on <laughs> visiting this show. I always try to to speak through images. I think that's very important. Because the way we look at pieces is, I mean, this is a product picture. It says one thing, right? Whereas the picture with a human in it says something else. It tells a story. Everything is about storytelling and trying to get people to look at my pieces from an angle that I want them to look at it. Um, and then also, Instead of, sometimes I use very meticulous hanging, sometimes I do this, just a super easy thing. Yeah. Let's see here. So, um, to exhibit, to me that is to show yourself, even though you show your pieces, that's clear but you also show you as a maker, right? I have never been comfortable with it. I'm a lanky, two meters tall dude, right? And now I'm even an old lanky, balding dude, right? So for me, I have to take me out of the picture. This is me, but I don't look at it that way, right? Mm. I look at it that this is a person on a picture. It's actually a picture. The picture is the finished piece many, many times. And when we began 20 years back with Lund, everything was perfection. We needed to do perfect plinths. We had to remake every exhibition hall we, we went to. We had to, you know, perfect walls, perfect paint. We repainted every stupid wall at least five times, right? I never do that anymore. I, I think more like, a, like this is a theater set, maybe? So I go into a place and I see what's there and I play with it, if, if you will, until I find something where, where it's supposed to be. That's, that's kind of a stomach feeling or core feeling that you get, that I get. Um, this is the same piece from before but from a, a big exhibition in North Sweden. And to me, in the beginning, it, the exhibition was how you came out not to you guys, to the public, right? And if you meet someone in the north of Sweden, or if you meet them in America or in Germany, that doesn't really matter. <coughs> the point is, you can, you can use similar pieces many times and have a completely different exhibition. I've had several times that collectors have come to me and I've showed the identical same piece, and they say, oh, 
this is interesting. It's way better than the one you had last year. And it's the identic piece, same piece. Not, you know what I mean? So it's all about how you show it, how you present it. Because we don't have, most of us don't have that kind of memory on, on, unless we use our cell phones. Um, so that leads me into me as a maker, crafter, and a macho. So um, I have, as I told you, I have different backgrounds. I've worked for years in completely male-dominated uh, workshops where everything was about how strong you were, how fast you were, and I've also been in other places where it was all about something else, right? And this is from when this series of forged pieces started. I went, I was an exchange teacher in SLU Carbondale in southern Illinois, and uh, this is when I started looking at what people did. I'd been away from the forging world, from the blacksmith world, for 15 years, maybe. I started looking at what do they do after a master's. And a master's in, in plastic forged work in America is super expensive. It's two years and you have to have a BA first. And then they're done, and every, most of them, what I see is that they do beautiful hammers or axes, or nothing wrong with that, they're beautiful, exquisite. But I see almost none of what they did in their higher education. So my pieces, the two messy things, is actually a discussion with these people, but they don't know that I speak to them. So it's an internal thing, right, for me. It's for me to deal with this kind of problem that I have, right? So this is how most people present themselves in the 4G world. They show pictures of when it's made. It's the same thing actually in the glass blowing world. Same kind of like, oh this is hard, this is cool, it's heavy, it's warm, you know, same, same connotations. So this is how they would present themselves, right? I don't have any professional pictures of this because I I want this, right? I don't care if it's if sparks fly or if it's heavy and, and <coughs> warm. I want, I want this. I want to see, okay, what happens if I brush it when it's warm until I can't brush it anymore? Then you get a very specific surface. And I change around these kind of surfaces because I need it, right? And it's a polished edge, but I do. I need to do it that way. So, um, this, is, this is my um, answer to this, the cool hammer thing, right? This is, this is the image of the match, macho toolmaker. So, the toolness in this is actually, it's not a tool, it's a tool-like object. They refer to the tool, but there's something else, right? I brought it back into this little white cube thinking that art, that sum of the art world resides in. And this is again where me and my photographer Christian, we go back and forth. I come to him and say I want a product picture and then we end up with this. That's how, how our collaboration usually goes. Um, and I think for me, the finished piece, I get my piece again and again when, when he sees my pieces through his lens, right? To me, this is a joy, to, to, to see them again in a different way. And um, I don't know if you agree, but to see the pieces together with me or other people tells a different story. So that would mean dealing with the machismo in, in myself. And I'm not saying that I'm not much, of course I am. But I'm trying to deal with it, right? Um, this is uh, the end show, the first of these pieces in southern Illinois. 
and it was a faculty show with maybe 25 different faculty members and they all had you know glass vitrines they had do not touch and I had the same signs printed but I said please touch and if you do that in an environment where students come in I think if you put please touch here some of you would just care gently pick it up and look at it right if you do that in the student environment this is what happens which I love I think that's fantastic and um, why I'm taking you through this journey is to see how one this is just one of my projects right see how that can come how that can be played out in different environments in different uh, stages this is uh, same project by invitation in an artist in residency in the former DDR. It's actually called, my name is Tobias, and this place is called Tobias Hammer. So, perfect, I couldn't say that, no to that right now. And it's a beautiful place. It's a, um, what's it called? Where is it? Oh, Waldhof. Yes. Waldhof or Druf. In um, no Germany, there they have Funga, there they have so Eastern Germany. Um, anyway, so so you see the big chimney there. That's the first time in my life that they had it's a huge coke kill. I never f didn't know that you could use that as a forger, right? So you could put huge pieces of iron in there and. Just wait for it. It wouldn't burn away. You just waited until it was hot enough, and then you could play with it, which was fantastic. It's uh, kind of like a kindergarten for people that like this. <laughs> so it's definitely a subculture. All of this is definitely a subculture, I would say. So we were um, five um, metal artists that were invited for this. We, of course, we helped each other and worked together. And it ended up with, I made three pieces and they all stayed in this place. That was the deal from the beginning. Um, I realized very early on that I wanted to do a continuation of the Toolness of Things series. Because um, it's a huge sculpture park. And many of these sculptures are Eiffel Towers. Does that make sense to you? and I didn't have an Eiffel Tower in me. So I wanted to interact with you know, this old museum place. So I would put them there and they stay there and they would rust slowly into the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I basically fell in love with this museum place and more than happy to leave the things there. Um, the last part that I want to talk about is, again, I've, I've touched upon it three times before, but uh, how you look upon your own pieces. If you remember the muscly back there before, same kind of pieces. I mean, these are a little bit smaller. I made them a couple of weeks back, but um, it's the same pieces. And when this young woman who, she's actually my daughter too, but still, it's a young woman, right? It tells a completely different story than that back or when I'm talking to her. So for me, these kind of collaborative picture series with Christian has become a part of how I assess my things. If I like them or not, or if they work or not. And of course, if you work with a young kid, you have to catch them at the right moment. So she didn't know that she was supposed to do this. It was just thrown in from the side. If I had prepared her for it, it would have looked completely different. But it's still like studio environment and so on. She, she needed a photo shoot for something else. Um, yeah, the handles are very important. And if it's an old, this is an old used handle, the first series I made the handles, they, they tell a different story then, if they look new. Um, 
but also if, if you have if you have a handle you need to have human interaction with it because then it's an extension of me as a maker or as a user um, yeah and again I don't have any detailed pictures but you see these kind of forged elements in here is to me you can look at them afterwards in real life but um, that's what how I've come back to blacksmithing or forged material is the joy of the materiality and the, the textures of it that's kind of what why I chose to step back into this yeah so this is a series that's half size they're still clunky there, there are two of them are there and one is in the window it's um, it's actually not from the Tulna series, they're called the ninth inning, which is in baseball the last chance to win, basically, a last chance. And it's also an expression that, yeah, last chance. Um, these pieces come from softball and baseball bats that I bought, they're old used baseball bats. So I used them as uh, handles. There are many reasons for that. I wanted to find some kind of connotation to America because I was there, right? But I also think it's interesting with the tool side of it because baseball is the largest sport in the world if you go after how many baseball bats are being sold. But if you look at how many people actually are active professionals in baseball, it's not such a big sport. Everyone knows it's soccer, right, or football. So that means that the majority of baseball bats is used for something other than baseball. That means probably a tool or maybe even a weapon or an instrument of detergent or something like that, you know? So um, pretty much all of these things, it's for me to try to figure out different things that I think about. It's not deeper than that. And also, I mean, I love Louisville Sluggers. I mean, who doesn't? Um, and this is this was just when COVID hit. We were invited. To, we had a beautiful venue in the Munich during the Munich Jewelry Week. It was the Orangerie in the English Garden in Munich. So it's a huge room, and we did it as a big uh, banquet table, banquet table. It's actually me and Nils Hint was also part of this exhibition. And we were four, we were faculty members from four different countries. Estonia, England, or UK, United States, and Sweden. Um, the reason for doing many of these things is because I think that it's time for forged material to take space on the arena of material-based art because it's for a long time as now again it's my subjective it's not true for everyone for me it's true it's time for for this kind of thing to be at the same arenas as all other material-based art is right instead of being their own subculture that's the reason why i fight for these big exhibitions because believe me it's a ton of work to do this. I know that some of you know, but it is. Okay, that's, that's me, the conclusion for the Forge series. And I'll put you into my, uh, I will do an exhibition in the spring, probably, at Galerie Sebastian Quilt. And that's, it's a collaboration between me and Wolfgang Bremer, the, uh, the Calabas color gold master. <coughs> and my photographer. So this is, I've never showed these pictures before. It's still not clear what I think about them or how I think about them. But it's again about body and these objects, how they interact with body, right? And uh, it was the uh, for Christian's wish that we stop using me all the time and start using different kinds of bodies. So it's me and her and the next session will be my dad. So different ages, different, yeah. 
this is very normal to do within the uh, art jewelry world, but in, in my world or this world, it's not normal. And it's again, I, it's tricky because it's very, very uh, easy to swap over to some kind of sexualized thing with naked bodies, nowadays especially. 20 years ago, not so much. So it's very tricky to choose uh, the pictures and, and tell the story from an aesthetical form point instead of, yeah, this one I love. Look at that. I mean, you see the burnout on the gold piece and you see my bold spot there? Oh. <laughs> Amazing. And, um, yeah, some of these pictures you see that she's a woman, some of, some of them you only see that she's a blacksmith, right? Because she's strong in that way. Yeah, thank you very much for listening and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite to be as on to uh, make it difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> I I am um, hello. 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 Inviting me. That's it. Spinning in. Go. I see my role here as. Uh, um, the silence after a talk. But hopefully you have tons of questions and raise your hand and you go before me. So I have a few questions, but I would love this to be a big discussion. And not only you and me. Of course, yeah. But uh, so let's start with someone has something. Or should I begin? And uh, this, this might be you. Feel free to ask the questions in Swedish. I think you already answered it more or less, but uh, as an artist, if you want to to express something to yourself or to, to or try to fulfill this this urge to, to express, you can choose different materials. You can paint, you can you can use plaster or textile, whatever. What made you choose metal? Because metal uh, can be very stubborn as an, as a, as a, as a material to, to, to and to find the the expression in this raw, if you excuse the expression, the raw surface of things that you execute, that you do. Uh, how come you ended up in that? That's very easy. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I think, I was a student at the Steiner School, the Waldorf School, and I was a very unruly teenager. Around 14, I thought school was the last thing I wanted to do. And back then, their solution to it was to send me to craft, at least for a couple of hours every day. So I ended up in a silversmith with a very good teacher. And she made me to uh, be able to focus. That's where the love started. But I have many loves in materials. I love wood. I love, yeah, I love paint, as you see. I love stone. I love... But my first love was definitely metal. But was there something in the material itself that, that sort of challenged you? Or yeah, I think, I think uh, what you said in the beginning, yeah, that it's very stubborn material. Wood moves, right? And it cracks and moves, and it has its own things. Fabric is, just slips out of your fingers. Um, clay is way too clay. <laughs> <laughs> I could never really, <coughs> didn't work well for me. I tried them all, but, but I think it is the stubbornness that I have to, that I had to use everything I had to, to master it. Well, that's not true, I've never mastered it, to somewhat control it. I don't know who's who. No, it's really not a question. I was just saying the grand slammer there. Yeah. I'm thinking about tennis, you know. There's tennis grass lab. So I was just making that uh, correction. That's actually a softball bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, you, you could you could imagine it's some sort of tennis racket as well. Yeah. You have fantasy. Yeah. Exactly. So, that's, so, that's, you know. that's the 
the other sort of toolness of things, but they're sport. Surrealistic tennis rackets, so yeah. to speak. And I didn't know them. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I said it, but I think all of you realize that they're just the gourds flat, right? You, you got that part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's very nice. Thank you. Sophia? Thank you very much, Tobias. Very nice. Uh, Make. Why? Why? Um, I have to go back, I think, when I, my first couple of weeks in a professional forge in Germany, it felt like I was at home there. But then after a while, I, I, I didn't, again, underling, not okay with being uh, the voice. So that's actually more now that I started being a voice in that material. And I think um, the making part is, it's a need, an urgency maybe. No, that's right. It's stupid, there's no money in it, it's just time consuming. So it's, it's probably a, an urgency and a love, right? That you get these kind of ideas and you start sketching and you're trying and then all of a sudden time disappears. Is that an answer? It was. Would you like to elaborate on why you turned from making your own handles uh, to using used ones? Yeah. <coughs> um, I think when I when I made my own handles, they weren't. Um, they didn't have a history. I think I liked that the fact that they had a history. So one part was the thing that I made that somebody else needed to create the history with and the other part had a recognition the history is also recognition for us as humans right if it reminds me of right that's the recognition and if we recognize it it becomes then you start thinking along those lines right so it's it makes it clear it makes it easier for me to lead you into what i want to talk about which is the tool right in this case or why we have handmade tools still, because it's absolutely unnecessary, right? I, I uh, remind myself of all people working out in the street with iron and metals. And uh, how, and also go back long ago to the iron uh, age. It's very far, 2,000 years ago. But it's also a way of lifting up this pit, not with all different, you know, many things. And you lift up their persons and lives, and their jobs. For me, a bit. Yeah. You don't focus in that way. Thank you. It's beautiful, but many connections. <laughs> I think you're spot on there somehow, but I think uh, we can go back to, like, I don't know, isn't it, pay, pay up, isn't it Duchamp and that generation that started <coughs> in the gallery context and makes us look at it differently, right? So that's, that's, yeah, that's, I'm definitely not a front runner in that. It's an ancient thing. But, um, I do think that what I try to do is to talk about something that might not have been elevated before, at least in the Tulna series. And if it's something that's fabricated in the Iron Age, or if it's out in the street now, of course, I find it beautiful, but, but it might just be a huge bolt that's been under the water for a long time. But that's, most people do that, I think. It's like finding a beautiful shell on, on the beach, right? But this is a little bit more. I, I start there and then I create something else. But also, I think uh, it's important to lift up the real and view the beauty of it. And I agree. Change, change. I agree. And I think that's uh, most material based crafts or arts and crafts, applied arts, mm -hmm. have their. Um, I mean, you have everything from people who make 
tiny trinkets that they sell on a bazaar on the beach in Brazil, right? Thousands of dollars on a big fair in, in uh, I don't know, Switzerland, right? They're all in the same craft, material-based craft. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. It's, it's super hard to make an object. It's just iron have been uh, not present, let's put it that way. If, if, if you just look at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, I think their last steel iron acquisition is late 1980s, I think. Might be early 90s. Since then, nothing. If you look at the glass, wood, whatever, right? They have current, current objects. And the same thing goes here, as far as I know, in Gothenburg, you know. So I'm not saying that I'm that person. I'm just saying that by, by doing this, uh, a larger body of artists that are material based within this field will stand on the shoulders of the ones in front of us, right? Is it better there? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think they're the only, as far as I know, they only have one uh, museum. It's called Metals Museum in Memphis, which is, by the way, a beautiful museum. That's the only museum dedicated to this kind of uh, craft-based metal art that I know. There might, of course, there might be. There's, there's historical collections in France and in England and everywhere, but, but I'm now talking about now. Uh, and of course they have, and then you have the whole subculture thing, and that's big in America. Um, but they mostly interact with themselves, which is, completely okay, it's just that I would like to talk with everyone. Yeah, that's great. That's great fun. And the first thing might be what I'm most interested in, and that is the Ladi uh, aesthetics and the macho aesthetics in your work now, but also very present in your work 15, 20 years ago. And I was wondering if I'm correct uh, that you macho uh, aesthetics and way of working 20 years ago, just being there yeah. and doing it, right? Yes. How, when, and why did that sort of change happen? Um, I think you're correct. I had, um, in the beginning, I had my own dogma. For instance, I had all of these craft ideas that if I didn't do it this way, I was cheating. You know, everything was about it has to be done the right craft way. And that's definitely connected to, at least in my mind, this kind of, I'm not putting macho now together with male. I'm talking about being very, come from a craft background and you're very hard on yourself. It has to be this way, otherwise it's wrong, right? So that's how it began. And then, exactly what object it was, is that, that wing nut in the beginning, I, I actually used body filler that all industrial designers of product, this kind of smooth curve that I wanted. Because my old self would actually try to forge the whole thing and I would have put down like a week at least on that piece and then I realized no I, I wanted to be red afterward so I don't care and then okay I'll cheat and then I realized hey it's not object when I realized ah oh, I'm allowed to do what the f uh, whatever I want but the uh, laddie get up big thing started with that I killed everything I did and by killing, I meant that I made them boring. I, I, they weren't alive anymore. That's what I meant by the laddie part is that, I mean, if, many of you must have seen people that go to car shows, for instance, and they make a replica. They have, they're so skilled, right? They, they make a replica of a car from the 50s or 60s, right? But they, many people don't dare step away from the replica. They have all of the tools in their mind to create something truly amazing, but they don't dare do it because that's against the rules. And that's kind of when I realized that I needed to step away from that. Did that answer? 
Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think the the um, the part that is actually about masculinity uh, is very present in your work now. That is about your your role as a as a quite tall, quite white, quite male, um, also educator and um, authority. Um, is something that is uh, not just um, there, but there and actively questioned, right? Okay. And I would, I would like to uh, hear more about how that sort of sparked. Oh, I'm this person in this room. In that. that definitely came from the university world. I can't remember what year, but it was actually the Swedish government that came in and said to us, I was working at Konsvak at the time, and they asked us to problematize and uh, implement gender and uh, minority 2010, 9, 10, something like that. And Konsvak started working like the School of Stockholm, asked, okay, what happens if we don't do it? And the answer was nothing, so they did nothing. And then they, probably all of you remember that they got anything. So um, that's definitely when I started thinking about it. Like, okay, can I change it? You know, and the daughters. I mean, I'm not allowed to say the same. I can't partner because the, just the fact that I'm me makes it more intimidating or scary, right? If I, if I lean against someone and raise my voice and say, stop it, it means a lot more than if she does it. And those kind of things is really, I have to deal with it. Pardon me. <laughs> I have one more. How, how much time do we have? Okay. Mm -hmm. you can, you can mm -hmm. Super. I would love to uh, take those off the wall. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Because I, I did with this one and I was. Uh, um, I mean, also, when you talk about toolness or sports or weapon or those kind of associations, I can do certain things with this. Other things with this. And I can do other things with, with this one, you know? Just a question then. Are they as heavy as they look? <laughs> I mean, this is comfortable. Can we turn it? <laughs> we all need to wash our hands afterwards. Oh, that's true. Lucky I'm the first. My question to you is about uh, or, or when, when you change size in that radical way, <coughs> is that something that is the, the, post, the sort of the I mean, I, even without actually putting that off the wall, I get a feeling of how can I interact with this object? And is that a part of the process or is that something that happens afterwards? Thickness and that's, I mean, most material-based people do that. They think about thickness, size, that's important. And sometimes, I mean, the big pieces from, from uh, Germany, they're not handleable. No. I didn't, I'm, I've never been very good at math, so I didn't do the math first, and they were so stupid heavy, so I could barely handle them myself. Right? With a shovel? Oh, 
Yeah, it was seven, yeah. horrible. Right? 70 kilo. So when they were hot, they become even more heavy. So yeah, sometimes yeah. it works and sometimes I mispronounce the material. <laughs> and sort of a, a connected question is, you're choosing this part. So can I yeah, sure. grab that? <laughs> Was that also part of the process of like what is actually touching the part that, that touches a head if it's a weapon exactly. or, or a ball if it's sports, right? Whereas the other piece in the window, that's that's actually the gentle part, the, the one that you hold on to. Hmm. So of course, if you change it to this, I mean, it looks. Monkey, right? To hold on to it. So then the right way to, to handle it is for what I would try to do is something like that, which is sort of giving me <laughs> hindrance. <Yeah. laughs> but of course, they're not meant to be used. They're, they're meant to talk about usage. Yeah, but you're still, you're still sort of starting with it, right? Yeah. And I mean, here they're very on the wall, like a tool rack. But mm -hmm. in, in Germany, they were on that big white table, and people were handling them every day, right? So it depends on how how you speak to the audience. By putting it on the wall like that, I, I tell people they're not touchable, right? Mm -hmm. so that's also a thing that you can play with. Sometimes you <coughs> are touchable. I mean, this piece is. The gallery here wanted me to nail everything down, so I did everything except for this piece. <laughs> and um, this is this is non-threatening. It's very gentle, and it's it's just it's just a soft piece of tool. Right? But you're right. As soon as it becomes bigger, heavier, it's it tells a different story. It's not gentle anymore. Mm. Right? Mm. Same sort of the big head and then the little head. I mean, is that I mean, the eye beholder. I mean, I can I can imagine things, but do you have a specific? Um, how do you say? It? It's not a coincidence, I think. No, no, no it's the gourds. Oh, okay. it's the silhouettes of the gourd. So All right. I always. Okay, okay. So for a project like that, I buy maybe twelve different gourds, and I okay. use six. And I want this specific, I mean, you, you all, you've grown pumpkins in the garden, right? You all know that they don't turn out the way you want them to turn out, usually. So I have to pick the ones. I want this, ba 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 you know, this kind of, ba -ba -ba. Big, yeah, the big mama and, and with a little head, you know, that kind of, that was. Do yeah. you make a performance now, or have you stopped performing? No, it's still recording. It's stopped still on? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> Can I continue? I mean, if you would make a pencil drawing on this wall, it's. But this is a flattened dirt. True. Right? Yeah, you true. have like yeah. smashed it. Yes. And that action gives me sort of also a feeling of history. Something being flattened, and conceptually, what what does that evoke in me? Is that something that has been going on? Yeah, but it's also the first thing that blacksmiths do. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the beginning. Bonk swells out, right? So I wanted the origins and things. Mm -hmm. What has been, how <laughs> do you have photos of, uh, or can you give an image of the process of first and then you're... No, no, I, I, no I cut it out, mm -hmm. part of it, and then I forge it so it's... Uh, okay. Yeah. But it's no. Is there any conversation between these uh, the toolness uh, objects and uh, the thing you said about you know the the cord being the the second ever vessel? Is there any vessel conversation about this? No, it's not the vessel, but it's it's the um, the aesthetics of it is the connection to the tool. I mean, I think the vessel must have been the first thing. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe the the grass that goes into the anthill is maybe the first tool. But, I mean, the tool and the vessel must have been the first thing of culture, right? So, tool, vessel. That's to connotate with the, the link.
So, so is there still a, a, a first a first shape link? No, I don't think so. Because <coughs> then the first link would have I would have needed to make like a very thin uh, grass. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question about this this work, and that is, have you uh, do you have a um, an experience of showing only one, or do you have um, roofs that I will only show this as a group? Yeah, I, I sell them separately, but I always show them as a group. Mm. And how does that change, showing them as individuals or a group? I think there's, there's aesthetical, um, not rules, but maybe uh, ways of looking at things. I mean, everyone who's worked in craft know that if you have a whole table full of ceramic cups, they will sell way better or look nicer than if you have just one. Right? Then if it's just one, it needs to be really, really special, that cup, right? Or if you just take a pile of nails, they look great as a pile, but one nail is just one nail. I've, I've done projects with nails too, the nail <laughs> things, but I mean, this is, uh, yeah. But it's not only that, right? Because it's also, you're giving us a feeling that this is a part of, of these are creatures. And, and not one wacky thing, it's but family. actually a family. Yes, yes. it's a family, and I've placed them so that they talk to each other mm. in pairs. Right. In family. <coughs> There's also an altar to, uh, I mean, Nils Hintz things, I, I placed them, he doesn't know about this, but I placed the thing above your head there, like a cross, and it's, all of these things are like altars. So this is also kind of like an altar for the tool, right? But it's definitely, it's all of these things. It's indivi individuals to speak to each other, and it's all of these. You know. But that's how we work as makers, right? We play with things until they become alive, right? And those two almost are kissing each other. Yes, yeah, so the, that's the one that's on the last one in the left doesn't communicate with anyone. No, not, not at all. <laughs> no, it's pissed off and in the corner. Yeah, it's Nicky Boa. Exactly. Yeah. Do you see other connections between the artists, different artists' work, than just the material? With our work here? Yeah, with the four artists. I think uh, Nils Hint is the one that I've worked with several times. And I think we have a similar way of looking at things. I mean, his first work that he got well known for within the jewelry world was doing exactly what all blacksmiths do. I think he was sweeping up his workshop, found bolts on the ground, probably a little bit hung over. I'm not really sure here, but I think so. And then put it in the um, forge, and then he took it under the power hammer until it became very flat. That's, that's the beginning of that series, which became, he became well known for that series, right? Mm -hmm. Which was the first step. And so that's, I think both him and I look at that. I mean, the, uh, the cutlery series behind there, that's also traces of cutlery, right? He makes a sandwich and smacks them under a big power hammer, it's all hot, and then you lift it out, it's a beautiful, delicate picture of cutlery. So that's definitely, we, we speak about everyday objects. And uh, I don't know enough about the others to, to but it, what I see, right? I would see that Hanagard is definitely working with uh, braids, you know, a hair braid, for instance, but that's also connected to chains. And I mean, she's also using the nail and things like that. It's all connected to things that are recognizable as a maker in, within forged material. And Rebecca is probably the only one. It's also recognizable, but not from a forged point of view. It's more recognizable from, um, we see these forms in our everyday lives, in chains, in, in you know, fence, and everything like that. I do not know exactly that's, if that's her intention, but she has dog tags, huge dog tags. That's the same thing, you know, looking at everyday objects and then tweaking them a little bit. Maybe that's the connection. There's an artist talk uh, with her last week, and then she used the, the pictures that you were talking about, this very stereotype mm. that is. Yeah. It's like a lot of fires and big tools, uh, but maybe it's a difference because she's um, 
yeah, she's not as tall as you. Um. Yeah, but she she did something I'd never done. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I worked for someone else for a while, mm -hmm. but she was actually a practicing blacksmith for 12 years, I think, 9, 12 yeah. years. So that was actually her, that's her identity, it's not mine. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>